Today we have a crazy revenge story against somebody that used another person's pictures to catfish. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, pervy boss fires my boyfriend, so I get him fired. All my life, I've never been much of a 9 to 5 person. Not just that, I've never pictured myself as someone who could work for an employer. One part of my reason was because I've always wanted to be financially free of my own accord. The other part was because of the fact that I was terrible at following instructions. I hated people telling me what to do, and I loved to do things in my own time. I had an older brother working in some company somewhere, and every day he always complained about how horrible his job was, and how he hated the way his boss breathed down his neck. He was always so stressed out and irritable. I guess you could say that image of him got ingrained in my mind growing up, and I never wanted anything to do with that kind of life. But then, when we're young, the world was strange and new and everything seemed possible. I always thought I'd make all the money I'll ever need by coming up with some type of invention that'll shake the earth to its core. I was going to make trillions of dollars from this and become the richest human on earth. Oh, and I was supposed to do this before I'm 20 so I'll have enough time to enjoy life. As a kid, I really believed this bull. It all seemed possible. It was never a matter of if but when. But then the years passed and reality started to hit. I wasn't the best student in my friend group, talk less of my class. I wasn't some kind of genius and I didn't have earth shattering ideas that make me money. After my high school, I went to college like everyone else. I still haven't figured out a plan for my life and like everyone in college I was just winging it. Even with this fact, I was still anti 9 to 5 and I was looking for more realistic ways to make money. The first thing I got involved in was cryptocurrency. This was during my third year of college as a business major. It was around the great crypto pump, or at least that's what I like to call it. I heard about Bitcoin when it was at 24,000, but I didn't understand it then, or knew how it could make me money. But in the space of a few months, it rose all the way to 50,000. The influencers on Twitter and Instagram were saying it was going to go to 100,000, so I decided to buy at 50,000. I used my allowance and all my savings from the past three years in college. Bitcoin continued to pump and at that time, I was wishing I had more money to buy so I could make way more money. But then it hit 60 something thousand and dropped drastically. I lost half my savings in that drop. After that, NFTs became a thing. I think I actually made a few thousand dollars flipping NFTs but after a while, I lost it all and then some to a series of rug pulls. This was when it dawned on me that my whole plan of getting financially free won't happen overnight. By this time, I was in my final year and ready to leave college. I wasn't receiving a lot of support from my parents anymore, so I had to figure things out by myself. It was around this time I met Kyle, through a friend of a friend. I was getting ready for final exams and all the stresses it brought me made me really cranky. My roommate Tori invited me to a party to help me loosen up. I didn't want to go at first, but after some persuasion I changed my mind and went with her. Tori's friend June was the one hosting the party. She was also a final year student. I think her major is literature, I can't really remember. She was very excited that Tori came to the party because she'd been hoping to introduce her to her cousin who was coming to the party. When he arrived, she introduced him to us as Kyle. The initial plan was for him and Tori to hit it off, but for some reason Kyle and I got along better. He had a weird sense of humor that not everyone got. We also bonded over the fact that he also lost a huge chunk of money in crypto. He was also the type of person who wanted to make money outside of the confines of a 9 to 5, but failed to do so. And because of that, he had to take a job in some firm. We had a few drinks together and talked all through the night. When it was time to leave, Kyle asked for my number, which I readily gave him. The next day, he texted and we chatted non-stop till the end of the week. After then, he asked me out on a date and shortly after, we became a couple. I finished my final exams and graduated from college. You'd think I'd be happy about this, but here's where the real trouble begins. I was totally responsible for myself from here on out, and I had to figure something out for myself. At least when I was in school, I could distract myself with my studies and all, but here, the only thing I had to figure out was getting a job that pays the bills. Tori finished college the same time I did and she moved back in with her family. I couldn't afford to pay the apartment bill alone. At first, I tried getting a roommate, but I couldn't find anyone whom I could live with in the long term, so I decided to leave. 
Kyle offered that I came over to stay in his place till I could gather enough money to get a place of my own. By this time, I was very broken, just about willing to do anything to make money. I talked to Kyle, and he told me that there was an opening in his workplace. I hated the fact that I didn't have a choice, but I had to do something immediately. I sent in my resume and I got a call for an interview two days later. I did the interview and got the job. I was to resume the next Monday. That weekend, Kyle gave me the breakdown. He wasn't in my department, so he couldn't look out for me every time, but he gave me the names of people I was supposed to make friends with because they were nice and would impact my career positively. He also gave me a list of people to stay away from. It was a pretty short list. In fact, it was only one person. Craig Jacobs. Craig was the marketing department's project manager. Everyone disliked him, partially because he was a slave driver and because all the words in his vocabulary were custom made to emotionally abuse his subordinates. But that's not all. The biggest reason was because he was kind of a perv who went after every female worker in the company. He had always gotten away with his bad behavior because nobody dared to report him. The ones who tried couldn't make the charges stick because of lack of evidence and because he got away scot-free, he frustrated those who reported the cases till they quit. I was going to be working with Craig and Kyle wanted me to keep my head down and that's what I decided to do. Unfortunately, that's not enough to keep Craig away, especially because I'm what most people call beautiful. On my first day, one of my co-workers Susan, one of whom Kyle told me to get close to, showed me around. She also seconded all the things Kyle said about Craig. I asked where he was and I was told that he didn't come to work every day. That was the only saving grace they all had, those little pockets of time when he didn't show up for work. The first day was quite nice. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it because I still hated 9 to 5s, but as good as 9 to 5s go, I'd say my first day was a good experience. But my good experience ended there. The next day, Craig came to work. He was a middle-aged man, probably in his 40s. The frown on his face looked like it was permanent. As soon as he walked in, he started barking orders at people, telling them to do their job, even though they were already doing their job. His eyes fell on me and he walks over to stand in front of my desk. He asked who I was and I introduced myself. He immediately asked me to get him coffee. I did and when I got to his office, he asked me to set in on the table. I sensed that there was trouble when his gaze lingered on me for longer than it should have. But the moment when I became sure was when he complimented me on my looks. He told me that I looked good and he always liked when girls did. I made an excuse to leave the office because I didn't know what would happen if I stayed longer. The next day, he told me to get him coffee again and I did, but this time when I wanted to leave, he asked that I stay because he wanted to talk to me. I had no choice but to stay. After closing the door, he returned to his seat and started to tell me how much he loved my outfit and how I styled myself. Then he walked over to sit at the edge of the table right in front of me. At first, he touched my blouse as if to inspect the material, but then he moved to touch my shoulder. I rose from my seat and walked over to the door, demanding that he opened it. He did and I left, but that wasn't the end. In fact, it was just the beginning. Craig was a guy who was used to getting what he wanted, no matter what. He started to target me in the office. He started to work me harder than the other employees. Even before I finished a task, he'd already find another one lined up for me. It was obvious that he was trying to frustrate me into submission, but I didn't break easily. I did all the tasks he gave me and then some. I usually hang out with Kyle during the lunch breaks, and that was the only time I got to unwind and complain about my job. Kyle always found a way to make it better, either by telling jokes or some other way. Craig saw us together one time, but he didn't say anything. I thought that was the end of it, but once again, it wasn't. He reported Kyle to the head of his department for fraternizing with a co-worker, which was against the rules. He even went as far as saying that he was making sexual advances towards me at work. After a series of back and forth with Kyle trying to prove his innocence, he eventually got fired. I was shocked and pissed at the news. It's crazy that the administration just took that decision without even asking me if what Craig said was true. I felt so guilty because Kyle helped me get the job, and he lost his because of me. But I wasn't going to cry about it. I wanted revenge. So, one day, when Craig told me to get him a coffee, I slipped my phone in my pocket with the recorder on. 
When I delivered his coffee, Craig made his regular advances, but this time, I pretended that I was open to it. I asked questions like, what do you want exactly? And he was explicit about the fact that he wanted us to have some type of sexual relationship. He even went as far as threatening to make my job more unbearable for me if I didn't do as he said. When I got the evidence, I immediately filed a lawsuit against him. I didn't take the recording to the disciplinary committee because some of them were friends with Craig and they can make the matter disappear if they wanted to. When the lawsuit became public, the company suspended Craig indefinitely to disassociate themselves from all the bad press he brought with them. I was also paid some money for damages and all the trauma I faced while working with him. When the issue was tried at court, lots of people from my department testified on my behalf. He was fined a huge chunk of money and when the case was finally settled, he got fired from work. I have so much respect for the people like OP that are willing to put their livelihood and their career on the line to step forward and take the appropriate legal action against a predator like this. It's really no surprise that once somebody steps forward and breaks that dam, that there are waves of people stepping up to report similar things. That said, our next story is Love That Went Sour. I didn't believe in love or marriage. Against all advice from friends and family, I was bent on believing that I wasn't deserving of the man of my dreams, or the type of love I'd seen in the movies. When I met Jason, I had no heart to love any man again. I had seriously hoped that Jason would not try to change my mind. Well, he did, and we both taught each other lessons that would last us a lifetime. I was 25 when I fell deeply in love. Initially, the word love meant movie dates, random kisses, deep stares that sometimes meant nothing, and endless arguments that were mostly connected to girls. Year 25 changed everything. I did everything I did before, but with some spice and intensity. My friend Abigail had tied the knot with the love of her life, and I was convinced I was next. The plot twist was that I wasn't next. And I wasn't next until several years later. I was scheduled to get married to Raphael, whom I felt was my one true love. What we had was truly special, except that it was more special to me than it was to him. On the eve of our wedding, Raphael suddenly became MIA. I waited patiently for the next morning just to know if he had pulled a prank on me. Unfortunately, it wasn't a prank. It was a nightmare I begged to wake up from. Raphael had indeed stood me up on the altar for a reason I never cared to find out, at least not in this lifetime. I lived my life in solitude, entertaining only a few friends of the opposite sex. I only wanted one thing in my career. I invested all my time into becoming a respectable banker in Los Angeles. One sunny afternoon, I treated myself to a long-deserved break at a quaint coffee shop, sipping on a cappuccino and reading a book. The aroma of freshly brewed coffee filled the air, and the soft jazz music in the background created a soothing ambience. As I turned the pages of a detective novel I'd gotten from a friend, my eyes met those of a stranger who had just entered the cafe. His name is Jason, and he had a warm smile that seemed to light up the room. I didn't look keen on starting any conversation, so I concentrated on my book. But Jason was determined. He found his way toward my table. Hi beautiful, Jason said with the most harmless smile possible. He started a conversation with me and I was immediately drawn to his charm and charisma. I must confess that I became enthralled immediately. Weeks after our first encounter at the coffee shop, we became more acquainted with each other. For instance, I found out that he was from a different culture, an immigrant from the Caribbean. To be honest, I was fascinated by our differences. I found his stories of a far off land intriguing. Days became weeks and weeks became months. I was surprised at how far I've allowed myself to enjoy the company of a man. We spent hours talking, sharing our life stories and discovering common interests. It didn't take long before I felt that maybe, just maybe, love could find its way back into my heart. Jason was kind, attentive, and made me feel cherished in ways I hadn't felt in years. His laughter was infectious and his eyes held a depth that made me want to explore the world he had come from. I knew I was falling in love and I loved it. Our connection deepened with a tick of time and I was eager to introduce him to my family. They embraced him totally and were eager to see us get married. It was clear to everyone that I was falling in love 
everyone who genuinely loved me was happy for me. After two years of having the best time with Jason, we decided to get married. I was so convinced that Jason wanted us to spend forever together just as much as I wanted it. We had a lavish wedding right in front of our families and friends of our family and friends. I remember our wedding day like the back of my palm. Our wedding was a joyous occasion, a celebration of our love and the beginning of a new chapter of our lives. At that moment, I realized that I would truly longed for my own man. I looked radiant in my white wedding dress. I had opted for a veil that flowed like a waterfall of dreams. We got married in an open garden that was in full bloom. It was a tapestry of colors and scents. As we exchanged our vows, our love felt like a fairy tale come true, a story that was being written with each tender glance and whispered promise. What we felt wasn't just love, it was a fairy tale, or so I thought. As the years passed in my marriage to Jason, things seemed perfect on the surface. We had indeed built a life together, traveled the world and shared countless joyful moments. But beneath the facade of happiness, a darkness had been quietly festering. It was a difficult reality for me, but it was just as true as it appeared. In less than three years of our marriage, Jason had become distant and secretive, and I began to suspect that something was amiss. I had lots of questions, but no one gave a concrete answer. Where did all the love go? I didn't want to accept that I was only entitled to bliss that would be short-lived. No, Jason could not have spent so much effort to make me his wife just to ruin everything with his distance, late nights, and excessive intake of alcohol. I knew we'd missed it, but I couldn't answer where or how we did. One autumn, Jason was away on a business trip as usual. He had more business trips than he had dinner or lunch at home. I was all by myself enjoying coffee while I munched on some slices of waffles I'd hoped to share with Jason. But thanks to another business trip, I had to have it all alone. I had all my gaze directed toward a particular part of the room where he kept his PC. Then I noticed the incessant blink on the screen that flagged a message alert. I didn't know what it was, but I was curious. I stood up to check why Jason would get messages on his PC while he was on a business trip. In my curiosity, I opened the first message on his email, which was a debit alert message. I was meant to stop, but I didn't. After about 10 seconds, I started unraveling the mystery around all the pain, regret, and shame I had gotten from my marriage with Jason. All of it was enclosed in some disturbing and unsettling emails and text messages on his computer. My heart sank as I discovered a hidden world of infidelity and deceit. Jason had been having an affair with a woman named Jessica, a co-worker from his office, for several years. The evidence was glaring and right in front of me, and it shattered my trust and love to pieces. In that moment of uncertainty, the memories of the pain I felt when Raphael stood me up at the altar came flashing back. That anger and pain that cut deeply into my chest like a razor that pierced deeply. Jessica had been there before we got married, and worst of all, after we got married. What was wrong with Jason? Was he playing me all along? I asked myself millions of questions in less than five minutes. One of the emails I read says, Jesse, you are my one and truest love. Never doubt it. Jason had written that to Jessica two days after our wedding. I was transfixed. Why? Why would Jason love another woman while he chose me as his wife? In that moment of anger and confusion, I couldn't help but wonder what went through his mind when he made love to me passionately. Did he think about Jessica? Did he prefer her? My questions annoyed me, but I couldn't help it. I suffered numerous panic attacks, but first, I had to wait for Jason to return. I was paralyzed and lame. When Jason returned from his trip, I couldn't pretend as usual. There was hell in our home and I was ready to let them all loose. Tears streamed down my face as I confronted Jason. He stammered, trying to explain himself, but his words were empty like ashes in the wind. I couldn't believe that the man I had trusted and loved and given my heart had deceived me in the worst possible way. A betrayal that shattered the beautiful mosaic of our supposed beautiful love. It was easier for both of us because he confessed to his unfaithfulness eventually, but what was difficult for me was his lack of remorse. He cheated on me that much, and he lacked remorse or empathy. How ridiculous. Our argument that night was loud, bare, and unfiltered. I minced no words with him. He walked out, 
and he never came back. Later, I found out that Jason had only married me to obtain his permanent residency papers, a visa to a better life. He had used my love, my trust, and my family support as a means to an end. I was the collateral damage in his quest for a green card. I was devastated, feeling like a fool who had been played for a pawn in a cruel game. I didn't believe the world was fair, at least not to me. At some point in time, I began to genuinely believe in love and fairy tales, but I guess there was no fairy tale myth after all. I was irrevocably broken. I knew there would be a divorce, it was inevitable, but I also knew I wouldn't go down without a fight. First, I had to take charge of my life and emotions. I channeled my heartbreak into my career like I always did. I found solace in my job. The irony lay in the fact that the more I excelled at work, the more the urge for revenge burned hotter in my heart. In spite of my pain, I had to wait for the right moment to strike. Years passed and I began quietly plotting my revenge against Jason. I decided to spill the beans on the cause of our divorce when I was ready. I exposed all the hidden secrets to friends, family, and all his colleagues who cared to listen. With a steely resolve, I orchestrated an elaborate scheme to expose Jason's infidelity and deceit. I was determined to regain my sense of self-worth and dignity. I exposed irrefutable evidence of his unfaithfulness, ensuring that there was no room for denial or manipulation. My actions led to professional consequences for him as his colleagues and superiors learned of his betrayal. When the truth came to light, Jason was left speechless. He had no defense and no excuses left. My revenge had left him exposed and vulnerable, just as he had left me when he betrayed my trust. After displacing him at work, I filed a lawsuit against him. He had used me to get his papers and I vowed to make him look worthless with his papers. I was going to jeopardize his chances of becoming a US citizen with evidence of his marriage fraud he may never realize his American dream. I didn't want him deported, even though he faced the risk of deportation, a consequence he had never anticipated. I was rather keen on making the rest of his stay in America as miserable as possible. Initially, he took everything away from me, my trust, my love, and my peace of mind, but what I took was his life, which he had spent so many years building. Honest question though regarding OP's story. While I completely understand how, as a coworker and a boss, it would affect how you think or trust a person on a personal level, finding out that they cheated on their partners so severely, my question is, should it affect their job if it's unrelated to that relationship? Like, finding out somebody is a massive cheater in their relationship, should that actually cause them to be able to lose their job that was otherwise completely unrelated to their personal relationship? I'd like to know what you guys think. That said, our next story is, girl used my picture to catfish, so I destroyed her image and connections. One random girl I met online was always asking me for my pictures. I thought she thought I was cute because that was what she always said, throwing compliments at me. She would say that she wished she looked as beautiful as me. One day, I jokingly asked her if she was using my pictures to catfish a guy, and that's where things got real. I found out that she was duping many guys at the same time with my pictures, so I just went ahead to report her. Now she's paying the consequences. I met Priyanka online. We joined an Instagram live class together where I shared a lot of my thoughts even though I was not the host. Immediately after the class, I checked my DMs to discover that I got spammed with messages of people telling me that they checked my profile and I'm so pretty, they really enjoyed listening to me and they could relate with my views. I took my time to carefully read and reply to each one of the DMs. Compliments were still streaming in, telling me that I'm smart and pretty. That way, I would never have been able to identify the wolf among the sheep. Every other girl was giving her genuine compliment with no strings attached. I stayed in talks with some of them too, making Priyanka even more disguised in the mix. I saw Priyanka as a very young girl from the things she was saying. I never really asked her age. But while everyone else left the superficial compliments and started talking about how my views changed their lives or how they could never have been able to speak as boldly as I did on the topic, Priyanka was still hooked by my beauty. And it was nice because I'm not the most beautiful girl. I have black color of hair, they're wavy, my eyes are brown and my lips are pink. You can walk up to any colleague and see more than 10 people who look just like me. I have a basic face, but 
Yes, I agree with her. I take care of my skin and hair so well, I may appear prettier. But at the end of the day, I was not any Naomi Campbell. Anyway, this went on for weeks. Priyanka always wanted to talk to me. She was mostly obsessed. She asked me how I got that pretty, if I did any cosmetics procedure or plastic surgery. I started to get wary here because even if I did, why should I tell a total stranger online? I did share my makeup routine with her because I just wanted to be nice. If she was this obsessed with being pretty, then the least I could do for her was show a simple way to doll up. It became a thing for both of us to share makeup routines, beauty products, and hairstyles. This girl legit dyed her hair from a sandy brown color to black just like my own to fit my hair color. I recall her saying that she would get into so much trouble with her mom and it wasn't even properly done. Priyanka didn't go to any salon to help her do the dyeing well, so I could even see how some sides were not even well blended, and her hair had been really damaged. But she seemed to be happy with the results. Who was I to judge? I asked her if she had only changed her hair color because of me, but she said no. That she always dyes her hair different colors when she wants to, and that was the next color on her list. Then apparently she was not okay with just knowing general information about me. She started following me on all my social media accounts. I didn't even tell her my handle or tell her my accounts, but now she was everywhere. On Twitter, on Snapchat as if she was looking for me everywhere to stalk me. Later, after she had searched the entire web for my name and initials, she came into my DM to ask me if I had any other social media accounts. I found this creepy. Now I absolutely get why people want to go private on social media. After she did this, I went private on everything. I could not have more than one stalker all up in my business. I rarely showed my face again. Even though I still posted pictures on Instagram, it was to my already following audience. Just because I didn't want to meet more people like Pri. She was actually a college student who was taking an art course. She lived with her mom and never talked about violence or all that other stuff. From my poking, she wasn't gay or bi, nor did she want to be with girls. So to me, she was just a harmless obsessor who just found a good-looking older girl to be her role model. I used to say things to her like, I miss being in college. Those times were so fun and free. We could do anything, go anywhere, spend money and still have our parents give us back. And most of all, I miss the parties. Priyanka tried to talk me into coming for one of her college parties. Nobody would even know you're not a college girl, which is true. When I was in college, all manner of girls and boys from all over would attend our parties, even from other schools. I mean, it was even cool to hook up with a person who was done with school. I liked the idea of being that kind of center of attention again. Because I used to go to rock parties, I was a total party girl who was always outside during the weekend. I said yes to Pri. I also told her that my friends would be thrilled to come. She was excited to be bringing not just one, but two to three people from out of school for the college party. We had a lot of fun. We were free to dance with anyone or talk with anyone, and there was a lot to eat and drink. However, I'm noticing how Priyanka always wanted to take a picture of me. When I'm chugging, I'm dancing, I'm singing karaoke, or just chilling, she's always carrying a camera to my face and asking me to smile. Or she'll hand me the phone to take a selfie of both of us or some random group. I was half drunk at the party so I couldn't even get words out of my mouth to express how suspicious that was. I'm the quiet kind of drunk girl. But anyway, after the dizziness wore off, I thanked her for inviting me to have the most fun I had in a while. In college parties, you spend little to nothing. The bills are on the host. That was not the way it was as an out-of-school adult. You had to pay for your own drinks. Well, more opportunities to go out came up. Sometimes it was with a larger crowd, sometimes it was small, sometimes it was during the day, and sometimes at night. Little did I know that these were times when Priyanka was saving pictures of me to add to her collection. She would take pictures of herself on my phone, then when she wanted to collect it, she scrolled down some even before the party and sent some of my personal pictures to herself. I never noticed this, but when I found out what she was doing, and I saw the pictures she had of me that I never sent, I knew it had to be at those parties that she took them. Attending parties and events with Priyanka kind of became a thing until she had to cut off the parties to read for the approaching semester exams. 
While Pri started to focus more on school, she had already reintroduced me to a lifestyle that I was going to keep up with, the partying life. I told myself that I would keep going out whether with Pri or not. I didn't need her to have a good time, so I called some of the friends I made while going out with Pri. They weren't college students, just like me. I asked a guy whose name was Noah if he was okay with going out with me. He was totally psyched to come and asked me to bring one of my friends with me for his friend AJ. Me, Noah, and my friends sat at a table smoking shisha and waiting for AJ. When he pulled up, he went straight to my friend and apologized for keeping her waiting. He greeted his guy, Noah, and immediately he turned to me. I knew something was up. He called me a name that wasn't mine. I think it was Sasha or something. I said, that's not my name. And he went blank. He showed me pictures of me that he had on his phone, that he used to chat with me until I completely ghosted him. I was shocked because the chats he showed me were absolutely not mine. I told him that the handle he was using was definitely not mine because mine was different. But the pictures were mine only that I did not send them. But I recognized every picture. Most of them were taken on Priyanka's phone. So right there, on loudspeaker, I called Pri for everyone to hear. I asked her if she had been sharing my pictures. At first, she denied. Then she told me she was only sending it to people so that they could admire her friend's beauty. AJ started speaking. She didn't know that he was there and that we could all hear her. Finally, the truth came out. She was only inviting me out to those parties so that she could take exclusive pictures of me and post it to the men she was catfishing to get some benefits from them. I was so pissed, I had to cut the call on her. Apparently when she found out that AJ was actually Noah's friend and we could meet anytime, she hurried to stop speaking to him and blocked him. That was the only explanation. So the next thing I did was show up at her school to report this very terrible behavior. Her mother was called and we confiscated her phone. I searched through it and found out that she was doing this with more than one guy at a time. I took the case to a lawyer. We had all the evidence against her for impersonation. Priyanka tried to garner some pity about how she only did it because she wasn't considered beautiful and that was the only way she could get attention from men. I went on to talk to her about it. All that was just in her head. She could even have passed as more beautiful than me, but in her head? Maybe somebody had made her feel otherwise, so the only way she thought she could feel good was by catfishing. Anyway, she was asked by her mom to pay back all the benefits she got from the act, and to also pay me a large sum to settle the law case before going to court. I actually went behind her back to do a petty move of actually talking to all the boys and telling them sorry for my friend's horrible behavior because she was using my face to catfish them. I'm in a relationship with the boy she liked the most out of all of them now. Priyanka was very hurt to find this out. While I certainly wish OP luck in their relationship, I hope that they're just not in it for the revenge factor against Priyanka and that they actually like this guy wholeheartedly. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another crazy revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.